This is Bloomberg Intelligence. We're really getting into now the streaming arms race. This is looking at that and saying we can really build a nice niche for ourselves. In-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. The dollar is the dominant concept in the planet. I think the acquisition is a natural progression of what Microsoft can do with this technology going forward. Bloomberg Intelligence with Alex Steele and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Over the next hour, we're going to dig inside the big business stories impacting Wall Street and the global markets. Each and every week, we provide in-depth research and data on some of the 2,000 companies and 130 industries our analysts cover worldwide. Today, we're going to take a look at the outlook for e-commerce as the space is expected to grow. Plus, does the steel industry face collateral damage from the UAW Big Three brawl? Oh man, I think so. But first, the European Union has a push to bring more regulation to the tech sector, and that's going to persist over the medium term. So we're joined now by Bloomberg Intelligence Technology Analyst Tamlin Besson. Tamlin, what is the problem that Europe has with big tech in a way that, say, the U.S. does not? Yeah, um, so I think the problem that the European Union has with big tech, I mean, one of it is that they don't have um, a huge industry necessarily to protect um, that maybe um, regulators in the U.S. do. Another thing, problem they have is that they look at the dominance of, of the large tech players over the last decade, two decades, and, and they see that it, they perceive this as being built on a lot of anti-competitive practices. So what they have been doing for the last, um, again, probably a decade, is filing lawsuits and trying to bring new regulations to bear on the tech industry to sort of rein in sort of those anti-competitive practices. You know, uh, Tamlin, for better or worse, I go back to uh, Microsoft and regulatory oversight from the uh, European countries back in the 80s. And um, so we've seen this game before. At the end of the day, nothing really happens. Hmm. What is the realistic expectation for what the European regulators would really like to see? Is it more competition? Is it just protecting its consumers? What's really behind this? Yeah, and and that's a great point, Paul. And and this has been going on um, for decades. And I think Microsoft is a prime example. And I I think it's a very fair point that when you do piecemeal sort of case law um, regulated or after the fact, um, trying to rein in the tech industry is difficult, and a lot doesn't change. And that's why sort of the new approach, especially with some of these rules, um, I guess in, in particular the Digital Markets Act, which is going to take effect in March, what this is is a sweeping new anti, um, antitrust regulation that's going to apply to the whole industry. And a lot of the practices that are going to be barred are sort of based on the case law that has developed. So looking back at Microsoft, this. There's a rule against sort of bundling services together. Um, There's sort of a rule against prohibiting your customer or or somebody who uses the app store from from contracting with a customer outside of your ecosystem. Of course, this has sort of been an issue with some of the um, Apple and Spotify and Epic um, lawsuits we've seen in the past. So what they're really trying to do is accomplish through regulation Mm -hmm. what maybe has taken a very long time um, to do through case law. And I think that's where the change is. It's really going to apply to the whole industry. And I think what they want to see is just more competition, as you said. So what companies then are most at risk here? Yeah, so so the nice thing is um, on September 6th, we're able to answer that question because the DMA, the European Commission, had to identify what they perceive, what they call gatekeepers. And the gatekeeper institutions they identified were Apple, Google, Meta, Amazon, and TikTok's owner, ByteDance. So those are the companies that are going to be at the forefront of this regulation and are really going to have to comply with these these strict rules. It's a chicken and the egg for a lot of people. Why isn't there really any tech in Europe? Is it because of too much regulation and therefore doesn't foster uh, any technology development? You know, and is there a feeling within the technology community in Europe that there's just too much focus on regulation and not on fostering innovation? Yeah, and I, I think um, depending on, on, on which groups you talk to, that, that is certainly a narrative that develops um, very quickly. Is, is that The focus is so much on sort of curbing what has made a lot of these companies very big that it's not necessarily going to create the breathing room that is really going to foster those next um, tech growth engines. And I, I think the you know, Europe obviously is trying to be more competitive, especially sort of you know, with the CHIPS Act, they're investing a lot of money in um, chips and AI. But but I, I think as to the question of why 
have not a lot of European um, tech companies started and really flourished and grown to the scale that you've seen in the U.S. and China? I, I think that's a very good question. I think a lot of regulators or, or a lot of politicians in Europe, I should say, are asking that very same question. Well, it feels like it's definitely a shoot first, ask questions later for the U.S., and then in Europe, ask all the questions ever, and then let things play out. You can see that in sort of how both continents are like diversifying into the energy transition, right? Here's a ton of money, go do stuff, versus let's get all the rules down first. Yeah, and I, I think that, it, that that's a very good point, Alex, and I think that really does it does go towards the differences of this. So the Euro- European Union is, is definitely like, well, let's try everything, whether it comes to maybe fostering innovation or, you know, unfortunately for the big tech companies, whether it comes to regulating. Mm-hmm. But we'll try to regulate everything and see what maybe sticks and maybe what was the best idea to regulate. All right, Tamlin, thanks a lot. Tamlin Basson, he's Bloomberg Intelligence Technology Analyst. Thank you very much. Keeping with the tech space, let's talk hardware as AI investment leads gains against the cloud, cybersecurity, and the metaverse. For more on the latest tech theme, jockeying, we're joined by Bloomberg Intelligence strategist Brianne Darty. All right, Brianne, talk to us about AI because I, in technology, it always seems like there's a buzzword. Uh, cloud was last year, year before, but, but boy, it is AI now. How do you guys think about it from a strategy perspective? So you're right. Everybody's talking to AI. What is most interesting to AI to us, and and to be honest, the the definition of AI, a lot of people talk generative AI. When we look at the theme uh, and the way we have actually scoped the theme, we're looking at a big picture AI. So the way that we're looking at it is that companies that develop and facilitate or utilize AI solutions. And so that's a pretty big catch-all. But what's really interesting about AI is it's serving as such a catalyst for so many other themes. And that's really what we explored here, where we were putting up AI, cloud, cybersecurity, and metaverse, because there's just a lot of crossover there. And um, they have some some synergies, but there's also really some standout differentiators across those themes. And so I guess the way I've thought about it so far, it just feels like we're in a very, very early innings of AI. And I hear every single company in the S&P 500 on their earnings conference call, calls uh, invoke AI. How do you guys think about it by sector within tech, it's like hardware, software, all that kind of stuff? Yes, yeah, so we've worked around. We've got software, services, hardware, and semis, semiconductors. Okay. I mean, everybody's talking about that. And then also, obviously, we have the media side of it, right, which is very important um, from an AI perspective. Oh, I see what you're saying. Like, like the, the metas and the alphabets. Exactly, okay. which are really using it, and that's kind of what you see. What A lot of people, when they think of the big fancy stuff, right, that's what they think okay. of. But there's a lot that's happening behind the scenes related to AI. I think, again, going back to everybody's talking about it, with good reason. AI is being integrated across business models. So when we look at some of the themes that are the most standout themes, right? We're building out a catalog of 26 themes. And the ones that are particularly compelling to me are the ones that are really serving to support business model adaptations. We're all trying to do things faster, better, yep. smarter. And AI is extremely well positioned to do that. And when we look at the influence that AI is having as well on the proliferation of cloud and support to the cloud theme, because what do you need in order to support all the natural language processing and machine learning? Well, you need cloud. And then you look at cybersecurity and the needs to make sure that you're protecting your information and, and AI and cybersecurity ever goes together. And then on metaverse, well, the importance of AI to gaming is in, is incredibly valuable. Yep, yep. And so all of these, when we look at kind of an accelerating theme, accelerating tech category, these themes are really working together with high differentiators, but there's also a lot of crossover. And I guess what I'm hearing from tech analysts that we talk to this is incremental capital spending. Yes. And that is what blows me away because some of the numbers I'm hearing from some of the tech analysts is just huge increases, which, you know, tech spending's always been healthy, yep. but now this is going to be a stair step type of increase. Oh, absolutely. But when you think about how it can be giving you a payoff in the end, right? As far as supporting more streamlined processes or, you know, organizations being increasingly more efficient um, or serving their client needs a little bit better. I mean, the ad potential benefits of being more directed advertising and marketing and, and make sure you're engaging with your clients a lot better. So there's a lot to be done. And, and so the spend is what organizations see is really building themselves towards, you know, a strong, resilient growth model. I like pictures. Uh, they help me understand things. And you guys I love them very, too. You guys, you have a very nice chart in your research note, kind of taking big, big theme items that we talk about a lot, cloud, cybersecurity, metaverse, and you kind of put them together and where there's an overlap, there's this thing called AI. Mm-hmm. And that is, that's a great way for to think about it because it seems like to me, AI came out of nowhere six it's, months it's ago, nine months ago. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's almost like giving a name to what's an intersection of what's already out there. Yeah. I guess I was looking for what's the Google of AI? Like, mm-hmm. What's that one name that's going to come out that says, oh, Google is the internet. 
AOL, <laughs> AOL is the internet play. Yahoo is the internet play. There isn't really an AI company. It's the confluence of a lot of technologies. That confluence are out there. of a lot. I mean, we definitely have we definitely have companies that are trying to secure leadership positions in the proliferation of AI. And you know, you listed off with a lot of the usual suspects. I mean, we yep. expect Microsoft. Yep. Meta, all these guys to play integral roles in this. I mean, there's two ways when we look at it from a theme perspective. There's really two ways that we look for companies and the role they play. One is their direct exposure to it from a revenue perspective, but also we look for companies that are integral in driving the adoption or the acceleration of themes. For companies such as those in these particular themes and AI specifically, I mean, they're kind of hitting from both sides. Yeah. And um, so it's going to keep those names really relevant. But we're also seeing more and more companies emerge as well that are they're going to be relevant as well. All right, that's great stuff. Our thanks to Bloomberg Intelligence strategist uh, Brianne Doherty. Coming up on the program, we'll get the latest on the trajectory of the e-commerce space. You're listening to Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. You can access Bloomberg Intelligence through BI Go on the terminal. I'm Alex Steele. And I'm Paul Sweeney, and this is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us Saturdays at noon Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. E-commerce is poised to hit $2.55 trillion by 2027, making up 33% of U.S. retail sales in comparison to today's 25%. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg Intelligence Senior U.S. Retail Analyst Poonam Goyal. Poonam, I remember when that number of e-commerce sales to total sales was stuck at like 7 8%. Was it the pandemic that supercharged everything? Yeah, I mean, the pandemic definitely accelerated the adoption of e-commerce by a few years. But... Um uh, prior to the pandemic, we did increase a little because the brick and mortars were adding buy online, pick up in store. They were also doing fulfillment. So that did step up the number from the high single digit to the mid teens, but clearly a marked acceleration to what we're expecting in 2027 with it going from 25% in 2022 to 33% of all retail wow. sales. Is this that the consumer is going to keep crushing or is this just stealing from brick and mortar? I think it's a combination of both. So the e-commerce sales that we talk about includes the brick and mortars e-commerce share. So it's actually total e-commerce sales in the U.S., which takes into account the brick and mortar. If you look at just the pure digitally only retailers, we have them going from one point roughly six trillion dollars to two point six trillion dollars um, for the total and brick and. The large share of that will be digital, but brick and mortars are also adding to that roughly one trillion in share. So it's not all digital; it's a combination of both. So, as a shareholder, do I care whether they generate a sales revenue dollar through a brick and mortar or through their e-commerce site? Do I care? As a consumer, you don't care. As a retailer, you could have different profit dynamics. So it really depends on scale here, and that's why scale matters. The $1 trillion that's going to be added, non-digital retailers are going to add roughly half of that. And um, non-digital retailers are positioned to ship from their distribution centers, and the bigger they are, the better scale advantages they have. The brick and mortars, it really depends on how much of their digital orders are done via pickup in store or versus delivery, and in what capacity the retailer is able to deliver the, those orders. So just to elaborate, like let's say you know, you're know you ordering something from Walmart. Now, if you're going to pick it up in the store, that's a very high profit sale for them because you're driving to the store. They don't have to pay that last mile delivery. Mm-hmm. Now, if they're shipping it from the store to you, that's cheaper than them shipping it from a distribution center 300 miles away from you. So it really depends on those dynamic scaled retailers have better systems in place mm-hmm. than smaller ones. So I guess I, f- I feel like whenever Amazon started eating everyone's lunch, it, it, the, the narrative seemed to be that that business model was the only one. And then it, it turned out to be a mishmash of brick and mortar and e-commerce together. Where does Amazon rank in the e-commerce world gaining market share? Yeah, so Amazon is still the largest e-commerce retailer, capturing roughly 40% of total e-commerce sales. They will continue to hold that share relative um, to our expectations. And, you know, Amazon's not just Amazon-owned sales. Right? When we think of the Amazon business, it's a combination of 1P, first party, and third party. And third party 
could be anyone. It could be a small business. It could be a person. It could be a student. It could be a teacher. It could be anyone that wants to use the Amazon platform to sell on it. And what we're seeing where the growth is and where the growth in the next five years will be, will be that 3P business. So as Amazon scales that 3P business, whether it's just a natural shift of businesses coming online or more people looking for the 200 plus million subscribers that it has to tap into, or if it's the Buy With Prime initiative that they've just launched where retailers that now don't sell on Amazon, small brands, big brands, can use Amazon's fulfillment and distribution network to tap into Prime members and let Amazon deliver that last mile, which is key because a retailer that's small in scale cannot deliver in two days or one day or same day at a, in a cost-effective manner. So using Amazon's distribution network to buy with Prime gives them that ability. And we know that speed of delivery is still very, very important to the consumer. All right. So I was going to ask you a nice, easy question for me, but you made it even easier. I was going to say, who are the winners and losers here? And but you've got a nice chart in your research <laughs> note, e-commerce positions, leaders, and laggard. So I, the leaders, I kind of all get the Amazons, the Walmarts, uh, Best Buy, all that kind of stuff. That makes sense. On the laggards, Burlington Stores, Dollar Tree, Ross, Tractor Supply, AutoZone, what are some of those companies not getting right? Well, to start, Burlington and Ross stores don't even have an online business. What? So how, not- can you, how can you not have an <laughs> online business? TJ Maxx has an online business. They do, but it's only 2% of their sales. That's that. It's very, very, very small. It's, it's really small. So the off-price retailers, remember, their, their whole motive is treasure hunt, right? So when you go to an off-price retailer, you don't know what you want. You don't have a list. You just know that you want to buy a dress or you want to buy something for the home or you want to buy a candle, but there's no really set um, definition on what you want. So it is about the treasure hunt, which is why they can kind of still get away with it and still deliver robust sales. When it comes to Dollar Tree, I mean, Dollar Tree does have an online business, but you have to buy in bulk, right? So unless you're planning a party uh-huh. or something big, everything's a dollar twenty-five, and it doesn't make sense to ship something that's a dollar twenty-five if the shipping's going to cost you more. All right, so you've also got another, again, I like pictures, so thank you very much for that. (laughs) Shares of like buy different type of uh, stuff you buy, sporting goods, electronics. What are the sectors of of retail sales that are just not hitting it off with the e-commerce distribution platform? Yeah, I think the one that stands out to us is autos. And it is one of the largest consumer sectors in retail, but its penetration of e-commerce is still in the mid-single digits. Uh. We don't, our autos analyst doesn't think that's really going up significantly anytime soon or in any time that he can envision. So that's probably because autos is broken up with vehicles and then parts, right? And vehicles is a bigger part of the business. People still aren't buying cars online. Mm -hmm. We don't have the vending machines that we've seen in China in play. So, (laughs) well, we have Carvana, but that's like a whole different. But it's small, right? It's Mm -hmm. still small. The bulk of auto sales are still done in person at a dealer. That's the model that we have here. And we don't see that changing in the next five years for sure. So given the size of that industry and the low penetration, it is the lowest of the industries that we track. Um, That's keeping e-commerce from scaling beyond 33%. You know, if you were to exclude autos and food and beverage um, and building material, I think the penetration would be much higher because those are the three categories that really lag. And they lag for the right reasons. Motor vehicle, we just talked about building materials. It's really a pro business, right? The Home Depot, Mm -hmm. Lowe's and others. And they want the stuff right away. They go in, they pick it up. They need it for the job right away. Food and beverage has logistical challenges. It's very hard to scale a business Mm -hmm. where you have perishables involved. Yeah, just ask Amazon. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, Amazon's having a tough time. We've seen it since they bought Whole Foods even. Um, so, so those are harder businesses, and they're sizable businesses, the food and beverage and motor vehicles. But where there is opportunity, you know, we know that electronics was uh, big in e-commerce, and it shows it's got 50-plus percent penetration there. But I think some other interesting categories that can gain penetration are clothing. We actually mm-hmm. think clothing can get to 50 percent, which, if you asked me five years ago, that penetration was probably around 20 percent. So, so there's a big wow. improvement um, for clothing. And home, same thing. We think AR, VR tools, the home market is very underpenetrated online. And we do think the tools that companies are launching, like Wayfair, where you can basically take a picture of your room and you can say, okay, I want a modern bohemian lifestyle. And they literally <laughs> change your room with links 
to how it would look, and then you can click into the items to purchase them. So those kind of changes in technology are everything going to help some of these sectors embrace e-commerce and the consumers being more comfortable shopping online. I mean, yeah. Like I'm not, I can't I say I've not used that before or anything like that. Although Wayfair keeps sending me the wrong items and then telling me to keep them. It's keep very, them, sure. That's it's very strange. Oh. Uh, All right, <laughs> yeah. Poonam, thanks so much. We appreciate it. Uh, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior U.S. Retail Analyst Poonam Goyal. All right, coming up on the program, we're going to get the latest on the UAW Big Three brawl. You're listening to Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. You can access Bloomberg Intelligence via BIGO on the terminal. I'm Paul Sweeney. And I'm Alex Steele. And this is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch the program Saturdays at noon Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. We'll be here each and every week at this time tapping into our Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst, covering some 2,000 companies and 130 industries worldwide. A strike at the big three automakers would threaten steel producers, with Cleveland Cliffs the most exposed, followed by U.S. Steel, Steel Dynamics, and Nucor. It's really the trickle-down of what could be a disastrous strike. So we want to welcome Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Basic Materials Analyst Richard Burke. Richard, let's just start with connecting the dots between like a GM and a U.S. Steel. might seem simplistic, but I think it's worth the moment. Okay. So basically, the automotive market end market for the steel producers account for about 25% of, of the market. So therefore, they're the largest buyers between the big three and the like tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers. So basically, GM, on produ- the current production levels, they buy probably about 100,000 tons of steel each month. Um, basically, Roughly, there's one ton of steel each car. So okay, that's so it's significant. How, so that's how it folds into the, the three producers. Right. Talk to us about just steel in cars. If I'm an automaker, do I have just like warehouses full of steel and then I just get it when I need it? Or is it just in time inventory? The steel guys are going to deliver me the steel on the railroad car just as I'm making the, the pickup truck. Well, the, it varies by producers. So for the big three, their inventory systems are tied into the steel manufacturers. And, for example, Cleveland Cliffs talks about how over the last few years they've renegotiated their contracts to get paid for the fact that they're basically kind of an inventory management system also. Okay. So for those three, yes, they're tied in kind of a lot more with their operating, you know, the two production systems are tied in. The tier ones, tier two, tier threes are a little less tied in than the big three. So – with that in mind, let's just pretend there's like a strike of 10 days, for for example. That's what a lot of the models are being estimated on. Um, what does that do to materially impact, say, a Cleveland Cliffs? Well, Cleveland or does it have Cl- to be like a three-month kind of thing? Right. I mean, it's going to have to be long, longer. Um, Cleveland Cliffs, is um, 44% of their sales are, are going to all market this year, they thought. So for longer... 10 days, they start to really get affected. They mm-hmm. also mentioned on the second quarter conference call that the, their auto producers had pulled forward some production. So obviously, the auto, you know, the big three, they're not dumb. They expect it kind of maybe we have a production, uh, you know, a union disruption. Maybe we pull for some, forward some production. So initially, you wouldn't see that big of a hit, but the longer it goes on, the worse it gets. All right. So net net, you get a strike. I mean, how much do you think steel production is going to be impacted? Steel output and pricing, and how's the market going to react? You, you know, if we go back to where it, what happened in 2019, GM, you know that historically the UAW has targeted one of the three um, producers. Right. Not that, all three at one not, time. Not all three mm-hmm. at once. And they kind of negotiate a target contract with one, then the other two kind of tag along. So GM was picked to strike. They struck GM. Um, it was about a six week strike. And steel prices over that time fell about 17% over the, those six weeks. So now after the strike was settled, you know, they struck on September 15th. Went to the end of October, restart working. 
then kind of by the end of the year, about 15% of that price recovered at the end of the steel price. But GM, for example, announced that they that strike cost them about $4, um, $4 billion EBITDA of a, where they only made $8 billion of EBITDA right. that year. Who are the other kind of industries that the steel companies are exposed to? Like, is there a concentration risk on that end, or is it just this is the way it goes? Well, the biggest um, end market of the steel producers mm-hmm. is construction, residential, non-residential. Okay, so that's also a problem. Uh-huh. So that's in certain also. areas, okay. <laughs> <laughs> in certain, right, certain areas. You know, on the, on the plus side, we do have this infrastructure bill, inflation um, reduction act, and other things coming along that's supposed to boost it. But we've definitely. What's really happened is, if I'm a, a person buying steel today. Mm-hmm. And I think there's going to be a possible strike. I think steel prices are going to go down. So I'm not going to buy today until if I think it's cheaper tomorrow. So you just have a lot, and it's happened probably over the last month or so, we've had a lot of just what we call hand-to-mouth buying. They're only buying what they need, and they're waiting to see if the shoe drops. And If I place an order for XYZ uh, metric tons of steel from U.S. Steel or Cleveland, whatever, when do I get it? About four weeks. Four weeks. And is there variability to that? Is that well, there is, when good times, that, you know, one of the things you do is watch lead time. So now okay. we're at short lead times, about four weeks, which means there's not a lot of demand. Mm-hmm. And periods of good demand, that can slip out to like seven, eight weeks. Okay. So how how is it being a steel guy right now? <laughs> um, I, th- I think it's like any, you know, two th- last year was very, very good for him. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think this year, you know, this reset, the talk of the recession that's six months away that we've been talking about for the last 18 months mm-hmm. right. has really, you know, caught, you know, influenced buyer behavior by saying, why should I buy today? If we're going in a recession, I can buy cheaper tomorrow. So you had a lot of, we've seen production, uh, production and sales down year over year. Because of people just kind of and a potential merger, right? A- and a potential merger that hasn't happened yet, but right, wasn't there a debate right, for, you, for U.S. Uh, Steel? You know, Cleveland U.S. Cliffs? Steel, U.S. Steel is in play with mm-hmm. Cleveland Cliffs has made a bid for them. I, I feel like that happens when maybe the industry is a bit weaker. No. Well, I mean, this one there's also a huge antitrust, most likely in this case, so mm-hmm. it may not um, come to fruition. All right, Richard, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. Very much looking forward to this. Well. Not really, but looking at the at the uh, other effects there, ancillary effects. Richard Burke, uh, Senior Basic Metal Materials Analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. Thank you. Let's turn now to the risk insurers are facing when it comes to leased planes. For more, let's welcome Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Property and Casualty Insurance Analyst, Matthew Palazzola. All right, leased planes and insurance. What's the story? Okay, so this also ties into Russia, Ukraine. Uh, so the backdrop here is about 80% of airplanes in Russia are leased, these commercial airplanes. Uh, Russia invades Ukraine. The U- U.S. and the West put sanctions on uh, Russia. So the uh, international leasing community is supposed to get back these planes. They can't get back the planes. The Russians said, we're not giving them back to you. The Russians re-registered the planes in Russia. There was about 500 planes. Uh, they got back maybe around 80 so far. The value of these planes is about $10 billion. Some are calling this like the biggest heist in <laughs> history because it's basically stolen $10 billion worth of airplanes. Um, these airplanes have insurance on them. So that's where the insurance component comes in. Wow. So, okay, <laughs> they have insurance on them. So then what happens? So the domestic carriers who lease the planes have to have insurance. So that's doesn't really matter to the the uh, lessors, but the lessors have uh, contingent insurance, which should pay off if the domestic insurance doesn't pay off. So essentially, these planes were stolen. The leasing companies are saying to the insurance companies, look, we have these policies. Someone sold our planes. Uh, we want to get paid. The insurance companies are saying, no, hold on a second. These policies have war exclusions in them, uh, so we're not going to pay you. So now we're involved in at least a year worth of litigation. There's been a recent development. So this has been going on since the beginning of the Russian invasion. But what recently happened is one domestic Russian insurance company settled with one of the leasing companies and gave them some money. So uh, people took that as a read of maybe the insurance companies didn't have a leg to stand on. 
I disagree with that, um, but it's a little bit of a longer story. Is this some place where a reinsurer is going to come in and insure the company? How do you get my reinsurance <laughs> well, your, angle in? Your favorite, your favorite subsector. So that's an interesting point. Um, so AIG was asked about this a little while ago at a conference, and they said, "Look, it is it's a risk, uh, but we have." a lot of reinsurance. So they have insurance for insurance companies. That's probably unique to AIG in this situation. AIG has been, AIG was one of the only companies in the world that would write these large lines of insurance, $25 million, $50 million worth of insurance. They stopped doing that and they've been in a a multi-year process of unwinding that. So I believe they have a lot of reinsurance in place for this event should they lose these lawsuits. And what's the EPS hit? So we did a scenario analysis. Uh, AIG recently consolidated a few lawsuits against it into one. Uh, that was that lawsuit is about three billion dollars. They were kind of the first named carrier on this. So we said if they were to uh, be responsible for forty percent of the loss and they had forty percent of it covered by reinsurance, it's less than a ten percent hit to EPS. But we think that's actually uh, Probably too high, given the comments from the company. So, what's the likelihood? I mean, if I'm, if I'm these companies, I'm not getting these planes back. I mean, what are they? What are, what are they saying? So that's that's the problem. Is once the Russians re-registered these airplanes, the uh, maintenance records are lost. So I'm oh. not a I'm not an uh, uh, airlines analyst. Don't kill me in the comments. <laughs> but they lose an incredible amount of value when you can't track the maintenance of the plane. So the leasing company is saying, oh, these planes are almost worthless. So even if we were to get them back, uh, that it would be a full loss. There's some talk about the Russians actually paying for them. Uh, the EU amended their sanctions to let that happen if it were to happen. I'm reading some reports where the Russian government's allocating $4 billion to it, but they're worth maybe 10 So there's a, a, a lot to sift through. How does an insurance company deal with this kind of thing. So, for example, you couldn't have necessarily predicted a Ukraine-Russia war, okay, sure, but in some ways that could be a risk that one should have been paying attention to. And you can make an argument that Taiwan and China, you should be paying attention to that also, or just geopolitical risk in general. How do you do that? So it's tough. I mean, Russia's already uh, a risky place for them to do business. The The big issue with insurance companies is when you get a correlated risk. So like a flood that floods all the houses in you know a neighborhood or something like this. This was Russia nationalizing an entire leased fleet. So it was kind of a black swan event that they didn't expect. But you know what they do is they have policy limits in place. So they say we can only lose this much on a specific policy. So when you think about the insurance business, let's say post Ukrainian war, do you think Russia can ever be insured again? I would think it's very tough for the international community to provide insurance in Russia after this. Um, I mean, the, the, is there a domestic Russian? There insurance? is. There is a domestic. Um, business. So uh, I I think they'll be okay within the country. But as you mentioned before, the reinsurance community is is outside of Russia. So it will be very tough for the domestic companies to have reinsurance. It will probably fall on the Russian government. Again, not a a Russia expert, but I think that's what will (laughs) happen. It's interesting because you think about it. um, If, you know, let's fast forward 10 years from now, and maybe this war is kind of a little bit in the rear view mirror. I want to go and build a factory to make widgets in, in Russia. I'm not sure I'm going to get that thing insured. Uh, you're you're not getting it insured from uh, from a U.S. carrier. Th- right. That's certain. Um, and look, the thing is, they may not they may not lose these cases. There's they have a leg to stand on. Um, so you know the, the insurers may be okay, but it still makes it incredibly hard to do business. All right. There. So I didn't even think of this whole angle: planes and Russian insurance. Is there other asset classes or that you're looking at? That oh boy, we got some exposure here. You know, as far as I know, no. I mean, there was a lot of the U.S. Uh, U.S. companies closed shop and stopped. I haven't heard anything from an insurance angle, though. It's funny. I, I we recently spoke to the uh, founder and CEO of Viking Cruises, mm-hmm. and he's got I think four cruise ships in Russia, uh, and they're not running. So <laughs> I'm sure he's you know it, yeah. the question is, do I ever get those back? Yeah, and they're not. I mean, why would they give them back? It would. This would have crippled the. Uh, Russian domestic airline industry, and it's it's still not good. They have some supply that they can build, but it was interesting. 
out of the Soviet era. They did, just didn't have the capacity yep. to build planes, so that's why they leased them. Our thanks to Bloomberg Intelligence Senior PNC Insurance Analyst, Matthew Palazzola. That's this week's edition of Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. And remember, you can access Bloomberg Intelligence through BI Go on the Terminal. I'm Alex Steele. And I'm Paul Sweeney. Stay with us. Today's top stories and global business headlines are coming up right now. 